Welcome. I want to welcome everybody uh, here live today, and I also want to welcome those that are that are zooming in for this session. Uh, I, I did have the pleasure to to meet our speaker uh, in the past, and I've heard him present. and You guys are are in for a great afternoon. So thank you for being here. A little bit a little bit of a background on Mr. Grennan. So Connor Grennan is the founder of Next Generation Nepal, known as NGN a nonprofit organization dedicated to reconnecting trafficked children with their families in Nepal. He's also the author of the New York Times bestselling and number one international bestselling memoir, Little Princes, One Man's Promise to Bring Home the Lost Children of Nepal. Little Princes has been shortlisted for the Dayton Literacy Peace Prize, was the winner of the Goodreads 2011 Best Travel and Outdoors Award, and has been translated into 15 different languages. Since NGN's inception, the organization has helped reconnect more than 500 children and their families. Prior to starting Next Generation Nepal, Mr. Grennan spent eight years at the East West Institute, both in Prague and in Brussels, in the role of Deputy Director of the Program of Security and Governance, where his projects focused on peace and reconciliation in the Balkans. Connor also serves as Dean of Students for the MBA program at New York University Stern School of Business, where he is responsible for more than 2,500 full-time and part-time MBA students. For his work with trafficked children of Nepal, Mr. Grennan was recognized by the Huffington Post as a 2011 Game Changer of the Year. In 2014, he was also named a recipient of the Unsung Heroes of Compassion, which was awarded to him by His Holiness, the Dalai Lama. Mr. Grennan is a graduate of the University of Virginia and the NYU School of Business. Currently, he resides in New Canaan, Connecticut with his wife, Liz, and his two children, Finn and Lucy. I think we can all appreciate when we talk about vocation, it's a calling. Uh, and, and Volcari is also the root word of voice. So not only was Mr. Grennan called, but, but he answered strongly with his voice. So ladies and gentlemen, let's give a great big gin and welcome to Mr. Connor Grennan. Good afternoon. Okay, again, it's such a relief to take my mask off. Thank you all for being here. Um, yeah, this is like my first time out of the house in, uh, you know, since like March or something like that. So it's awesome to come here. So thanks for, thanks for coming. I think that, uh, you know, a bunch of you, maybe some of you have uh, read this book. Some of you have, and I think that, I never know if it was like an, was this like an assigned thing? Was it sort of like, you can like nod or shake your head, don't you? You have to take off your mask. Okay, so so this is the thing, like it's it's one of these things where I, I uh, like I remember getting a book like this and um, and thinking um, just I just desperately didn't want to read it. I mean, and when I see this book especially, I kind of like, my heart goes out to you a little bit when you get uh, a book that looks like this because it looks uh, hideous. Um, in just sort of that it, it looks like kind of a boring book. I know that my parents, I don't know how your parents are, my parents would always give me these kinds of books to read and to uh, try to, so I would be more like, uh, more like uh, the author. So, um, so I want to sort of like just try to pull back the curtain a little bit on what the, uh, in this case, at least the author uh, is like, which is me. The, um, I guess the other thing is just, uh, you know, when, when this subtitle came out, again, the Little Princess part is, uh, that totally works, I think. The, uh, the subtitle is something that the, uh, the, the publisher came up with, and I never liked the subtitle. And it's uh, One Man's Promise to Bring Home the Lost Children of Paul. Uh, and I always literally uh, almost forget what it is. And I guess the reason that I don't tend to love books like this is that it just looks so serious right up front. And I think the reason that I sort of sometimes don't love reading books like this is that I often don't, um, you know, relate to the person doing it. I've kind of read them and, and they tend to be books, uh, at least in my experience, where, you know, the author has just, you know, always had this, you know, dream of like, you know, helping, uh, you know, helping kids, like helping traffic kids in Nepal or something like that. And then finally they like got their opportunity and then they, 
you know, they helped the kids in Nepal and then they, uh, you know, got some recognition for it. And then they wrote a book about it. And now you have to, and now you have to sort of like follow along on their adventures. And I was never, to be totally honest, I wasn't ever really inspired by these books because again, it was hard to see how they kind of like went from just like living their life to this. And I just never sort of like found myself in that story. So I want to kind of like just right off the bat, by the way, if you were assigned this and you have not read uh, the book, I'm about to do the, you this incredible service, which is I'm going to like, I'm going to talk through the book really from beginning to end. So, you know, you'll be able to sort of like, um, you know, lie to your uh, professors and tell them that you read it. So like, this is going to be essentially just like sort of like a summary uh, of the book in a way that will make you sound like a super genius after, after we're finished here. And it's only going to take an hour. So, um, so the one man's promise to bring home the lost children of Nepal. Okay, let's just take a step back here. I didn't go to Nepal to become uh, one man promising to bring home uh, the lost children. The reason that I went to Nepal in the first place was really because I just wanted to go and trek. I wanted to trek up to, uh, you know, Everest Base Camp and all that kind of stuff. But it was this was part of a longer uh, year-round uh, trip around the around the world, which I was, you know, really excited to do. And I was telling my friends, like, oh, you know, I'm going to go on this year-long trip around the world. And, uh, and you know, a lot of them started sort of, like, thinking, like, oh, well, you know, are you going to, you know, stop and, like, volunteer anywhere or anything like this? And that seemed totally ludicrous to me because I wanted to sort of, like, enjoy this trip. This was my, you know, long vacation. I'd saved up for this for a long time. I had just quit my job. And I had no plans at all to do any kind of, like, volunteering. And the reason that this all changed which, again, you know, somebody was kind of pointing this out to me earlier today, too. It's like, wow, why did you actually put all that information in? And now, in retrospect, maybe I shouldn't have written it, but because it doesn't make me look that great. But it's already in the book. So what happened was I was sitting there uh, in, a, in a bar, and I was, um, you know, talking to this girl that I had this huge uh, crush on. And, um, and I was, you know, kind of like telling her, like, oh, you know, I'm going to go on this trip around the world, and I'm going to go to you know, 17 countries and, um, and, you know, in essence, just sort of like trying to make myself, um, you know, sound awesome, which I really thought of myself as very awesome at that time. And, uh, and I thought like, oh my gosh, you know, she's going to be so impressed. And she just started sort of like, you know, clearly like looking over my shoulder for like anybody else. Cause I think I was going on and on like anybody else she could talk to in the room. And, um, and so I'm desperate now because I can see that she's sort of like, you know, putting her hand on the counter being like, well, you know, looking at her watch. I'm like, I'm like, this is like my last chance. So I was like, uh, and now in retrospect, I kind of feel like a jerk having said this, but, um, but I was like, you know, I'm also, uh, you know, I'm also thinking about volunteering and, you know, she stopped and she looked at me. She's like, oh, that's amazing. You, you know, where are you thinking about volunteering? And I hadn't thought about it because I hadn't planned on volunteering anywhere. So I was thinking like, where am I going to volunteer? So I knew I was going to Nepal, basically, on kind of like my first stop. So I was like, Nepal. And she's like, so you're going to Nepal? Like, you're not going to like trek, you're going to volunteer? I was like, mm hmm that's right. That's what I'm doing. And, uh, and she's like, that's amazing. I'm like, yes, that is pretty amazing. And she was like, so what are you going to do there? And I was like, um, you know, I hadn't thought of it. So I was like, uh, I'm going to work in an orphanage there. And she's like, you're going to work in an orphanage in Nepal? I'm like, that's exactly what, yes, I'm going to work. That's exactly what you just said. I'm going to work in an orphanage in Nepal. That's what I'm going to do. And it's going to be amazing. And I'm, just, and she's like, how long are you going for? I'm like, like three months. And she's like, three months. I'm like, mm -hmm, that's right. And uh, so I'm kind of getting deeper into this line. And, uh, and then sort of like a few minutes later, she's like, okay, well, I got to go, you know, oh, gosh, I'd love to hear more about that. I'm like, well, maybe we can go out tomorrow. She's like, oh, I can't, I'm going out with my boyfriend. I'm like, what? So, um, so apparently like, so that didn't work out and I, I whatever I'm married now. So, she, you know, in her face. So like, so here's the thing, like I had like scheduled, like all this stuff I planned. I'd like started telling everybody, she had told everybody that I'm going to do this orphanage in Nepal thing. And I didn't uh, like kids. And so I was thinking like, how am I going to do this? Because the truth is, despite my, um, despite what I told her, uh, I really was going to Nepal just to trek. That's why I wanted to go. I'd had this dream ever since reading Into Thin Air by John Krakauer, which is a phenomenal book, um, to at least go to the base camp of Mount Everest. So I did that. It's the first thing I did. That is uh, the base camp of Everest, that like uh, Black Pyramid, that is uh, Everest itself. And it was amazing. And 
you know, I was like, on, you know, I, I was about to say I was on top of the world, but I didn't mean that, that in the corny pun way. I was just like, I was feeling like great, right? And so I'm like, oh my gosh, this is so great. I love Nepal. And then I realized that I was going to have to uh, actually go uh, and volunteer for three months, which was going to be a total nightmare. So this is the thing. This is where I was, right? So you all probably like already know where this is, but like, so Nepal is sort of, uh, you know, sandwiched there between uh, India and, uh, and the Tibet Plateau, China there. Um, so that's where I am. I'm on the other side of the world now. And I'm showing up to this orphanage. And this is this orphanage, right? And I come down this path and I go to that blue gate and I'm standing outside the blue gate and thinking like, I just really don't want to be here. I don't, I don't, again, I have nothing. Um, there's nothing that interests me about this. I don't like kids. I don't want to volunteer. I don't want to do anything. And I didn't know what an inside of an orphanage would look like, but I assumed that it would be, um, you know, a pretty sad uh, place because, you know, if, I mean, you're an orphan in Nepal, like what do you have going for you? Right. So like, so I figured I would have to go in there and I don't know, like, you know, just be like, Oh, Hey guys, like, uh, you know, I'm so sorry that, you know, your orphans, you know, in the, here in Nepal or whatever you say to orphans. And then, and then that would be kind of like it. And then I would be like, um, that would be the volunteering. You know what I mean? And then I could sort of like go and I would, uh, you know, they didn't have like much electricity or anything like that, but I would like read or something like that for like the next two months. So that's not actually how it works. I don't know if any of you had a chance to work with kids before. Uh, I hadn't. And, um, but it's not like that because kids are not like that, right? Kids are, um, kids are like this, right? And so they're like, they're just, all they want to do is like, you know, jump on you and have a great time and like, sort of like feel like, oh, you know, let's, um, you know, let's play to this, you know, big kind of gangly guy. And I was like, oh, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to do that. But like, um, but you don't really have a choice because now you're in, you're in this village in Nepal and you're sort of trapped. And so they're jumping all over me. I'm like, holy cow, like I got to like, you know, at least like get these um, little people outside, right? So, so we got them outside and, you know, they're, they're kicking a soccer ball around and I'm like, okay, you know, like so far so good. And, um, and they just really wanted to just, you know, show me everything in the village. They wanted to, um, they wanted to ask me like, you know, a million questions about like, oh, what's, you know, what's America like and what all, you know, and sort of like, you know, they'd only seen like little bits and pieces of like Bollywood movies. And they're like, is it like a Bollywood movie? I'm like, I have no idea. I've never seen a Bollywood movie. Um, and now I have, and they're like four hours long and you're only dancing. So it's not really like that, but like, but this was like their image of anything outside um, the village. And so what they really wanted to do though, they wanted to show me the things that they were proudest of in the village. And so one of those things was of course uh, their school. And so uh, so the, you know, they all want to like take a photo in front of their school. So I'm like taking a photo, you know, one after the other, one after the other, one after the other of their, of their, uh, of them, you know, sort of like standing there. They all wanted their own photos in front of the school. And then uh, this boy Santosh was like, uh, you know, hold on, you know, he's, hold on, hold on, Connor brother. And so they call me Connor brother. That's what you call people like, you know, uh, Jane's sister, Connor brother. And uh, he's like, this is going to look a lot better if, uh, if I have a goat. And I'm like, you know, what do you mean if you have a goat? And he comes running back, you know, with a goat. I don't know where he got the goat, but like, but this is where I was like, okay, is this what it's going to be like? Just like three months of like taking photos of kids and letting them like give me, uh, you know, tours of the village and stuff. Like, I didn't know what else we were supposed to do. Right. So like, so, but you know, I, the day is like sort of like going on and it's, you know, it's nice. And you're sort of like, you know, kind of like just walking around and kind of like making giant circles um, of the village. But by the end of the day, I was like totally exhausted from just like answering all kinds of questions about just like everything from everything under the sun. And by the, by the end of the day, they were like, sort of like, we were kind of like coming back and they're like, Oh, let us show you, uh, you know, the toy cars that we made. So they, they had made these, um, you know, toy cars, right? Sort of like they, they just like cut up old, um, you know, flip flops and they use like sticks and stuff like that. And like, they all have them if you can kind of see. And it was this amazing moment where I was like learning, like, this is how like, you know, this is how they sort of like have toys. Right. And the things I bought them all these like matchbox cars, which they then like proceeded to just like destroy within like, you know, five minutes of me bringing them 9,000 miles. And they ended up going back to their toys that they had made out of trash. And it was just this interesting moment for me where it was occurring to me that 
kids actually just like need this, right? I mean, like you kind of think like, oh, these poor kids have like no uh, stuffed animals or these poor kids have like no toys or something like that. And you realize like in these moments, they actually don't, like they need certain things like education and, you know, and like, you know, water and food and things like that. They don't actually need toys. And there's this amazing thing where I was realizing like the toy that I had brought them, which broke in like two seconds and the toy that they, that they had themselves were like, wildly different and i was imagining this of like sort of like putting those two toys next to each other right like one it was like this perfect matchbox uh car that actually looked like a real car and it had you know wheels on an axis the axis that would go and all this kind of stuff and then on the other side like literally just like trash where they could like make their own toys out of trash and and if you asked me just kind of like looking at these two things i would think well you know this toy is obviously better than this toy but in fact, it really wasn't. I mean, like this, like allowed them to like use their imagination and to use their ingenuity and innovation and all that kind of stuff to actually make their own toys. And it just got me thinking, like, I just had this perceived notion, and this, by the way, came to me years after the fact, that pretty much everything that we had was better than their than their stuff, right? And again, I know that's not sort of a hugely kind of politically correct thing to say, but like. I just sort of assumed that our stuff is better than their stuff. I mean, like, what isn't better? Again, like, you could argue maybe on, uh, you know, food or the beauty of the landscape or something like that. But otherwise, like, our hospitals are better and our schools are better and our cars are better and these are better and these are better. But then you kind of, like, get down to sort of, like, how kids thrive. And kids thrive just by creating their own thing. So I think that one of the lessons that we learned kind of early on was we don't just need to bring the kids things. And that was the other thing, actually, they, they, you know, when they, people sort of like come and they say, oh, what can we bring as volunteers? It's interesting. We tell people now, like kind of like years later, having formed this organization, not to bring like pencils. Like people will bring like pencils to the kids. And what that does actually is it gets the kids thinking that American pencils must be better than uh, Nepalese pencils. And, you know, and then it's sort of like it also doesn't do great things for the economy. But it's just this idea that we need to bring them things is actually just kind of a little inaccurate. It's actually just what they need is like you know, literally like clean water and like wells and things like that. But anyway, so this was a neat moment for me, but it was also, to be totally just blunt about it, utterly exhausting. And literally like as they are going to bed, I am just like ready to collapse. I'm, you know, completely at this point, like regretting uh, having, you know, signed up for uh, three months with these, with these kids who are um, just exhausting and kind of annoying. Um, but they were like super cute, right? They're all sort of like piled in bed and they're all, like, you know, um, you know, flexing their muscles because they saw like, you know, I was like picking them all up and all that kind of stuff. And so they're, they're all like, you know, cute and in bed. And they were asking me um, just question after question. And even at that moment, they were like, uh, they were like, Connor brother, like, uh, uh, what's your favorite food? Right. And I'm like, I don't know, you know, go to bed. And I'm like turning off the light. And they were like, uh, and I could hear them whispering. And they were like, uh, you know, but it's, I bet it's goat. And I'm like, no, it's not goat, right? So like I went back in, I'm like, okay, so it's not goat. It's probably like um, you know, probably like hamburgers or something like that. They're like, oh yeah. You know, that sounds amazing. You know, what's you know, what's a hamburger? And I was like, you know, hamburger, like uh, you know, like beef. And they're like, yeah, that you know, that sounds awesome. You know what, you know, what's beef? And uh, and I was like, how do these kids not know what that is? And the reason, of course, is that um, you know you know, all they eat every day is rice and lentils, right? This is what they eat for breakfast. And this is what they eat for dinner. In fact, the first time I got to Nepal, I, you know, I sat down with this kind of like local family to kind of like start integrating into the Nepalese culture. And they gave me this like rice and like this hot boiling like lentil soup, which first of all, that you know, you're supposed to eat with your hands. They all just, they all just start digging in with their hands. Like we're sitting on a mud floor and I'm thinking like, this has got to be a this has got to be a joke. And like, but sure enough, there are no utensils. So I'm like, okay. So I just like, like eating with my hands and all that kind of stuff. And then I thought, okay, well, I've now tried like the local cuisine and, uh, you know, great, done that. You know, now tomorrow I'll have something different. But then we woke up, you know, the next day and um, at breakfast, they, they did the same thing. And I'm like, oh, okay. You know, leftovers or whatever, that, that's cool, I guess. And, um, but no, like that night they had dal bhat again. And that's when I found out that like literally every meal in Nepal is dal bhat, right? It is rice and lentils. So they don't have a lot of, you know, um, variety. So as I'm telling them like what beef is, and I'm like, you know, hamburgers are and all that kind of stuff, I'm like, beef, you know, it's like, it's like, you know, it's like cow. 
and I didn't know uh, I didn't know anything about the Hindu about the Hindu culture before um, I got there, so I didn't um, know that you know cows are like this sacred animal, right? I mean, like their cow are like cows are like deities, right? So so like when the cow like you know kind of comes wandering like through the soccer field, it's like oh, okay, well you know the, the game gets interrupted because like you know cow, you know, and like and the cow has as you can kind of see like this uh, tika, which is like this blessing on on its on its forehead and it's um this is like this is like sacred right so like for me like to all of a sudden sort of you know introduce them the first night that like oh my favorite food is to you know literally like murder their murder their deity and and, and eat it and this is like everybody america you know all americans love this we just like love this like beef beef so like that was kind of like shocking and i then they were just like shocked and like <laughs> this other volunteer was like you can't you can't say that you know and she's like yanking me out of the room and stuff and so finally i'm like okay i'm like going to bed that night i'm thinking like I think I have to do better than than I've been doing so far. Do you know what I mean? Like because I haven't been doing that great, and I haven't even, you know, this is like what the kids all look like to me on these like first days, right? They all dress exactly like, like their hair color is exactly the same. Their haircuts are almost exactly the same. And to me, they were just like all the same kid. And I was like, you know what? I'm actually probably going to have to kind of like dive into this to a certain extent in order to um, just become better at. Except this kid. This kid is like always. This kid's different like all the time. Like he's just always kind of like screaming my name over and over again, um, which isn't weird at all. But like, so over and over again, I was just like, okay, I am going to have to get to know these kids. And I did. And so over the next like few months, I actually like really got to know the kids. And I kind of got, I kind of got into the village life and just sort of how different it is, right? So one of the things that's different is again, like you see these women, like women seem to do like all the work in these little villages. I don't know how, I don't know how that works. Uh, I just like see like men like sitting around with like drinking tea and stuff like this and the women are out in the fields. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know why that's okay uh, over there, but it was getting to know that village life. The other thing that was sort of strange about Nepal at this time, and this is back at the end of 2004, kind of beginning 2005, was there was a civil war going on at the time. And so all these soldiers were kind of like everywhere. Again, it didn't really feel overly dangerous, but it was just kind of like this constant presence, right? So sort of like the Maoists and the king were sort of like, you know, at war. So we just kind of like had soldiers around us uh, all the time. But the crazy thing, the strangest part about this was, as I got to know the kids, and these are like a brother and sister, um, as I kind of got to know the kids, I was like, you know, I'm actually like really genuinely enjoying this. And I think that that's what I've learned about volunteering is that like volunteering isn't really, let me say this. What I used to think about volunteering was that either you liked volunteering or you didn't like volunteering. It's like, you know, you either like doing this or you don't, or you're either this kind of person or you're not, which now I realize is like the most ridiculous thing. It's sort of like, you know, saying like, oh, well, you know, I don't like broccoli and thus, you know, I don't like food, right? It doesn't make any sense. Like there's a million different kinds of things. I just never really tried to volunteer before. But once you sort of like end up throwing yourself into something, it's actually hard not to really get invested. And that's, I think, what happened with me there. Like I just like got really invested in these kids and actually because I had nothing else to do except live in this tiny little house in this little village, I actually really grew to like love the kids and actually really enjoy being with them so much so that crazily enough, I actually decided that a year later I would come, like when I finished my big round the world trip, I would actually come back and stay with the kids for another like, you know, two or three months or something like that. So I did that. I came back a year later and, you know, Nepal changes very slowly, right? So like nothing really had changed. The kids are all wearing the same things. Kids wear the same thing every day. They wear the same thing and then they wear that same thing to bed and then they wake up and they're still wearing the same thing. They have one other set of clothes which they call their beautiful clothes, which is like a really special occasion or something like that. But otherwise, like they're just like, you know, they even looked exactly the same. Like that's kind of how I was able to kind of like tell them apart early on because they had just, literally they had different clothes. But so it's one of these days, right? It's like this beautiful day and I'm thinking like this is just nice and peaceful and I'm really enjoying this. And this really wacko thing happened. So we're all just kind of hanging out outside. And then that that path that that I came, you know, that I came down to the to the gate. This woman is coming down the path, and she is clearly not from the area in some way. She just was dressed differently. She was dressed more like, I don't know, like a person from the village or something like that, right? Not this village. This is a village outside Kathmandu. I'm talking like a village like way out. And we're thinking, nobody ever visits 
the orphanage. Like, what could somebody possibly be doing coming here? So she comes all the way down, and we had our, uh, you know, our house manager who spoke uh, the language kind of, like, go up, and we were like, you know, can we, you know, can we help you? And she was like, um, yeah, you have, uh, you know, you have two of my children here. And we're like, okay, that's, and at first I thought I'd misunderstood the translation or something. I'm like, did she say two of my kids here? That doesn't make any sense. And we're like, oh, you know, I'm, gosh, I'm really sorry, but we can't have two of your kids here because all these kids are, they're orphans. They're, they don't have any parents. And she's like, no, no, those are my two kids. And she pointed up and, you know, kind of like standing on this sort of a terrace that we have were two kids that like totally identical to her. And their faces were like stone face, like staring at this one. And we're like, what? is going on here so we invite this woman in and she tells us this crazy story right so the crazy story is that she lives out in like the far reaches of nepal so nepal was sort of like you know shaped like like that basically and she lives like all the way out in this area called homeland the far northwest part of nepal and the far northwest part of nepal it is, it's, again, it's not like just like stepping into this remote area. It's like literally like stepping back in time. Like you have to understand, like if you showed them a photo of like a car, they would, they wouldn't be like, oh, a car. I've never seen a car. They would say like, I don't know what that thing is that you're showing me. Do you know what I mean? Like one of these kids actually told me one time, years later, he's like, you know, when we came out of the villages, you know, it's, it's, and you'll see photos of it later, but like there's, there's no wheeled vehicles in this area because you'll see it's just everything is on a mountain. Everything's slanted, right? So they don't know what a bicycle is. They don't know what a car is. And they walked. This kid had to walk for like days and days and days to get out of the mountains. And he said that he was on these like tiny little trails. And there in Nepal, like you don't say like left or right. You say up or down. You know what I mean? So you're either going up the mountain or down the mountain, right? They don't even talk in terms of like left or right because everything is on a slant. And he said that he got off this like little trail and he got to this path that was like, you know, this like sort of like this like ballroom type area, right? Like smooth and it went on for miles and it was wide. And he's like, why would anybody need a path this smooth and this huge? And he sees some guy like running toward him. And this guy's coming from like a long way away. He's like, who is this guy? And this guy, and he's like, what is happening here? Because this guy, and the way he said it was like, kind of like a sweet way to say, he's like, he thought that in this area of the country, men could like run as fast as wolves, he said, because like this guy was flying and this guy zoomed past on a motorcycle. But this kid had never seen him. He didn't even know what a motorcycle was. So he just thought this guy was like running past him like really, really fast. But that's why I say like stepping back in time, that's what it feels like. If you showed them a light bulb, they wouldn't know what a light bulb was. If you showed them like running water, all that kind of stuff. There was a time where I got out there eventually, like later in the story, I took a photo of a woman and I, I then like showed it to her and she was just kind of looking at it and she's like, hmm. And, uh, and then everybody around started like screaming because like they realized I had taken a photo of like her, but she didn't recognize herself because there's no mirrors there. Like she had no idea what she looked like. So I showed a picture of herself and she didn't recognize herself. So this is what I mean. Like this is where this woman had just come from, right? But this is how remote it is. And so Maoists at one point came into her village and said, listen, we are going to be taking over this country, right? I mean, like the king, you know, the regime has been in power like 250 years and the king owns, uh, you know, something like 127 houses or something like that. And meanwhile, you are all just like praying that your crops survive, right? So all of a sudden, like people are like, okay, so they kind of like end up like rising up with, um, you know, the Maoist rebels and taking over village by village by village. And soon, like the entire country is taken over. And then the Maoists need more people. So they do what you always do in these places, which is to start taking the kids, but no parent is going to let you take their kid into this rebel army who no matter how much you believe in this cause and so the parents fought back and then the Maoists just would go into schools and you know literally kill the teachers and just sort of take like 80 kids at a time into the army so it became a very dangerous place very very quickly and so what they did was they came to this agreement with the Maoists and the parents which said every family will give up one child to the rebel army right but again if you're a parent, you do not want to give up one child to the rebel army, right? So what they did was they just, you know, were sort of like, you know, praying that something would happen. All of a sudden, this guy comes through the village, this guy they didn't know. And he said, listen, I have a solution. I'm going to save your child. And here's how I'm going to do it. I'm going to take your child and I'm going to bring them over the mountains to the Kathmandu Valley, the capital, Kathmandu, where, you know, the king still controls it. It's safe. And I have connections to a boarding school and they'll go to a boarding school. And the parents are over the moon. Now, of course, this guy's going to take their child for 10 years, 
So it's going to cost them everything. So they sold like their house and their land, their animals. That's all they had in the world. They'd like move in with neighbors, but they paid this guy to take their child, not knowing. And they only found out months and months later that this guy was a child trafficker and that he was just like stealing these kids and selling them into slavery. So for most of these parents, they just never saw their children ever again, because getting to Kathmandu was almost impossible. And then once you're there, again, there's no way to find, it's like literally like trying to find a random person in even the city of Erie. And like, where would you even begin? Like, you know, just like literally trying to like walk around, like looking for a kid with a name who's been changed or something like that. So we're learning all this from this mom, right? In this moment, we're like, holy cow. So we realize that all these kids actually weren't trafficked kids at all. They were all, I mean, they were all, they were all trafficked kids. They weren't orphans at all. They were trafficked. They all had family. So we're thinking, holy cow, what do we do, right? Well, we couldn't really get them back to their families right away because the Maoists controlled Humla in this whole area. And my friend had gone out there and she'd gotten kidnapped by the Maoists out there. So it was too dangerous to try to get them home. So what we did was we took those two kids and we just started bringing them to visit their mom who had now kind of like had this little shack up at the north part of Kathmandu, which is like a two hour drive for us. So this is great. There are two kids that start at the bottom. The kid she's holding is like their little brother that they had never met, you know, because he was uh, born when, after they had been trafficked. So we're sort of like, you know, bringing them to visit the mom. And one time we showed up and this is where this mom is living in this little, uh, in this little shack. And there are seven kids in there. And we're like, uh, where did these kids come from? And she said, Golka, who's this child trafficker, just dumped them with me. And she couldn't, you know, he's too powerful back in the village, all that kind of stuff. She just had to say yes. And she would sort of like take on these kids, even though obviously she had nothing to even feed them with. And we're like, holy cow. So my colleague and I started literally bringing food every few days uh, to her. It was like a two hour bus ride to her and dropping off food and all that kind of stuff. But we knew obviously this wasn't like sustainable, right? So like they had to get into a better place. And so we found a better place for them. We found this place called the Umbrella Foundation. And they said, don't worry, we'll take the kids in because we couldn't fit them in our children's home. And we're like, great. And the kids are getting ready to leave and they're really excited, all that. And then uh, this was in April, I think it was April 6th of 2006. I'll never forget that date because the horribleness of it all was that the Maoists declared right then that they were going to um, start to like really rebel and they were going to shut down the Kathmandu Valley. They're going to invade the Kathmandu Valley and all the people would rise up with them. And the people at this point were on the side of the Maoists, not the king, because the king had started to, oh my gosh, the king was like, you know, shutting people down and he was like arresting journalists and he was like doing some horrible things. So now people really were on the side of the Maoists. And the Mao said, okay, like, we'll come in. And the king was like, you know, you can't. You can't sort of like, you know, they're organizing protests. So the king shut down cell phone coverage in the country for a month just so people couldn't, like, organize. And people still organize. And then they said, okay, we're going to, uh, you know, shoot anybody that walks out of their house to protest. And people did, and they started shooting people. And it just got very, very dangerous very quickly. And so I had to leave the country along with, you know, kind of everybody else um, who was a foreigner. And, uh, but I got home, watched the revolution unfold on CNN over the course of like three weeks. And, you know, the malice and the people overthrew the king and everybody was happy, all that kind of stuff. And that's when I got this email. And I got this email that I'll never forget. And that was from Viva Bell. And Viva was the one who ran the Umbrella Foundation. And she said, Connor, listen, it took us a while to go get the kids. And I was like, yeah, of course, because you couldn't get on the, on the streets. You know, they were like setting fire to cars. She's like, right, but the problem is that we got there and the kids had been um, taken by the child trafficker again and sold uh, as slaves. And I was like, well, can you find them? And she's like, we wouldn't even know where to begin. Like, so we can't, we're not going to be able to find them. I'm like, oh my gosh. So, so that's the moment where I thought, okay, so either I decide that that's it, you know, and like, okay, so, you know, I did something and then I tried my best and all that kind of stuff. And then, but, but I also knew that if I didn't find them, that nobody was going to go looking for these kids. And I also knew that they would, really be in serious danger because kids don't tend to survive that long if they're in those kinds of conditions. So I started this Next Generation Nepal little organization just to go find those seven kids and went back to Nepal. And I mentioned that because, as I said in the beginning, when you sort of saw the cover of the book, it's not like I was like, oh my gosh, I can't wait to, you know, start an organization and what should I start and which kids should I help and how should I do this? And oh my gosh, I can't wait to just change my life and change other people's life. I didn't want to do any of this. I was home. I was so happy to be home. I was so happy to be back in America. I had no intention of leaving at all. 
but what can I do? Right. I mean, like there are these seven kids that I had sort of like told I would take care of and nobody else is going to go look for them. And I knew them. So I went back to look for them. I mean, like, again, it, all of these like little steps that I was taking were just like tiny little steps that anybody would have taken because you had no choice. So it's not like this big, like, oh, I'm sitting here. I think I'm going to go do this. It's like little tiny, tiny decisions that kind of like take you like to sweep you along. Right. So this is what I did. Right. I went out and I had this photo of the seven kids. There's one kind of like tucked behind there a little bit. And I started like looking around. Couldn't find any of them, by the way. Couldn't find any of the kids. And it took like months. And then one time I got this call from uh, this woman uh, who said, hey, that, that girl, I think somebody may have seen this girl. Somebody may have seen her in this little village called Tenkot. And I'm thinking, Tenkot? Okay, so that's like pretty far away. It's like a three-hour drive. So I go over there and, you know, nothing, right? I'm like searching for hours and all that kind of stuff, and she's not there. And, uh, and I'm realizing like, okay, so this is, this is not going to work. I had this whole idea. I had like raised money, all that kind of stuff. I had this whole idea that I was going to be able to go to Nepal and find these seven kids, and it didn't work. It didn't work. And that was very painful because... I was looking all over. I couldn't find these kids anywhere. I was now in this village where this girl was supposed to maybe be, but she wasn't there. So she was either like, you know, somewhere else or, you know, something. And like the only way that I could possibly find her was if she like literally walked out in front of me. And luckily that's what happened. She walked out in front of me. So she literally was coming up the path as I was walking down the path. She was being held by the wife of a child trafficker who was living in sort of a building all the way in the back there, if you can kind of see. And she had these two water bottles because you know, the traffickers weren't even giving her like water or food or anything like that. They were just like literally like letting her kind of fend for herself. So she found bottles in the trash and was finding her own water. And so I sort of like scooped her up, uh, which, you know, I don't know if I was really allowed to do or not, but uh, I just sort of like scooped her up and just ended up bringing her with me. And one by one, we actually started to find all the other kids. So this is a boy named Durga. You can sort of see how skinny his arms are there. I don't know if you can see that. Um, yeah, he'd been, he was in a coma when I found him and uh, brought him to a children's hospital uh, along with this other boy. And uh, it's a children's hospital, but there's grown-ups in the beds because they didn't have enough nurses. The hospitals, you know, they weren't great uh, out in Nepal. And so I stayed with them for a couple of days there and they started to get better. And you know, one by one, again, we started to find them all. And you can sort of see the boy at the end was the other boy that I was in the hospital with. And they're just like emaciated kids, right? They were just like really, really sick. So we kind of got to them just in the nick of time, I guess. And this is the last boy. It took us 10 months to find uh, Bishnu. Um, so if you've, read, if you've read the book, you know. Also, if you've read the book, um, I remember this only this morning, uh, HBO did a documentary called Finding the Way Home that J.K. Rowling put together uh, back in December. And so one of the stories is about, is about him and how we, how we found him. But this is the thing. Now, suddenly, like, we have all the kids back. This is my colleague, Farid, who is, uh, plays a big role, if you've read the book, the young French guy uh, that I did a lot of this with. And we realize, okay, so now the civil war is like over and we actually have to get the kids back. So how do we get these kids, how do we get these kids home? So I started like asking, you know, all these different organizations, you know, can you get these kids home? Can you like, you know, go out and start finding the families? But nobody would, nobody would do it, right? Nobody wanted to do that because they already have like their budgets set and all that kind of stuff. So I was ended up, you know, I ended up thinking like, okay, so I guess in the end, because nobody else would do it, I guess I have to just try to do it myself, even though I had no idea if I would be able to find any of these families. But again, it's not like I was sitting in my, you know, at home. I'm like, I can't wait to start an organization. And then I'm going to go into the mountains by myself and try to find families. It's just because nobody else would do it. So I had no choice but to do it. Like, and I was already out there. So again, these are all like little tiny baby steps along the way. So I took this little cargo jet, uh, which landed on this, you know, dirt dirt runway those are uh that's tibet in the mountains uh in the mountains behind that and i ended up um finding through some colleagues like some people who like live there and they were sort of served as like you know kind of porters for me and we needed sort of a big group because there were a lot of traffickers in the region and there were a lot of obviously maoists in the region and so you see what i say about like why there's no like bikes and cars like just it's mountains that's all it is there's nothing flat down there at all and we just started walking through literally walking through the mountains and just trying to find the families of these kids. And we had like, you know, 24, 25 photos of kids. And it took us like two days, I think, just to sort of get to uh, this first village. And we started asking around with these photos. And sure enough, somebody said, I think that this is a kid that disappeared like three years ago. And next thing you know, uh, I'm sitting next to the mom and dad of 
this little boy that's my on my right is my uh guide with the hat on and the parents are on my left obviously so this just started happening like we you know spent four weeks you know down there in humla or up there this is the mom of the girl that was holding the two bottles um and just and this is the well i won't go into that but this guy in camouflage turned out to be a, a malice so that kind of created huge problems later i didn't realize that at the time um but a lot of things like you know went wrong obviously out there again but you know we got um snowed in and i got uh injured and um you know i was supposed to try to catch like this helicopter out that never came so i had to like walk out anyway a lot of bad things um happened on that trip uh because we were just out in the absolute wilderness for for four weeks um but we also ended up like you know getting a lot of these kids home you know in fact all of them we kind of like found the families of of all of them but it took a really really long time but that's kind of how next generation nepal was born just from this right just from sort of like just going and going and going and going one tiny step after another and so eventually now we have i don't know yeah it's like five or six hundred kids that we've like reunited with their families which is hard because it's you know you just have to go out and you have to take a photo of the kid and you have to walk out into the mountains and you have to find the families there's no sort of like shortcut to this uh this kid i just think is funny he has like big glasses that we gave him so i always put him up there but that's kind of it. I just sort of like, um, let's see how we're doing time. Oh, we're good. Um, so I wanted to just sort of like, just kind of like shoot you through that story. So again, like if you haven't read the book, you know, congratulations. Now you've kind of like, you kind of read the book. But more importantly, I guess I just like the main point here is that it's not like you have to have some giant calling in your life right now. Sorry, this is just me talking. This is now not fact. This is just my soapbox here. And then I'll get off in a second. To me, and me only maybe you don't have to have this like giant calling in your life and feel like oh my gosh i need to know like what i want to do with my life and what's my passion all that kind of stuff Who, it doesn't matter like kids were never my passion i hated kids i literally i could not stand kids i now have two of them you know they're they're good i like them but like but before that i just had no interest in them whatsoever and if you told me like well you're going to be like starting a nonprofit organization that rescues traffic kids and reunites them with their families like i would have said you're crazy like it's the exact opposite of what i wanted to do so just this idea that you need to know or that you need to find something. I think the thing is, what I found was just like exploring like different things. And then when you find something, just like try it out. Do you know what I mean? Like just try it out for a while and don't give up. And then that's it. And I know that sounds super corny. Try it and don't give up. I don't mean it like that. I just mean that to get to sort of like this level where you've like ended up like doing all of this stuff was only because I just did like the next little thing in front of me at that moment. I had no plans on starting an organization or surely not writing a book or anything like that the book i'll i can talk about but like it was a complete and total accident it was only because i'm like this is kind of cool and this is the next thing it could have been anything and that's what it's going to be for people it's just going to be like the next thing that you do the next thing you do and at some point you know, you're going to find that thing so that was a little preachy i don't want to get preachy i hate getting preachy so like but i just wanted to share that like it's not like oh i went from this to this it's like every tiny little step along the way anybody would have done that too Okay, I'm going to stop kind of like just kind of talking for a second. Now, I know that um, we do have some questions. So if it's okay, I'm going to kind of like go through some of those. Um, but if you have like a burning question that you're like, I just need to know this, I'm going to get, I'm going to kill myself if I don't, just like, you know, holler it out or something like that. That's fine too. But I'm just going to go through some of these questions um, if that's okay. So, um, yeah, so like one of these questions is about like, um, is there a place that I would like to travel to that I haven't yet? And I ever thought of like permanently staying in a place where I traveled? Yeah, you know, there's definitely places I would love to go and everything like that. But in terms of like staying in a place, what I loved about traveling was knowing, like, I love America. Like, I really like, I'm not like, like, I love America. I don't mean like that. I just like, like being in this country. And I lived abroad for my entire twenties. Um, so I know that I want to be here. I know that I want to live in America. So one of the fun things about traveling and living abroad is that you feel like, you know, at some point, I know this isn't like the end. I know I'm not like now stuck in this world because I know I'm going to move from there. So like, I love traveling and I love sort of like just living in other places where you're going to eventually like find yourself kind of coming back here. But I don't know that there's that many places that I would still like to go to Australia. I've never been to Australia, but then yesterday on, um, on Instagram, somebody posted a, what was it? It was like, like a wasp eating like some kind of spider and they were both like the size of my fist. And so now I don't want to go to Australia anymore. Um, okay. So, uh, has your book accomplished all that you hoped? Oh yeah. So, um, this is a question just about the book. Like, has this book kind of accomplished everything sort of that I hoped it would accomplish in terms of bringing awareness to Nepal? Um, oh, yeah. Like, 
by like leaps and bounds. Um, let me just tell you this in case anybody is kind of like interested in, in writing or wondering how a book um, comes about. Because this book I wrote thinking it would just be sort of something we'd give out to like, you know, donors to the organization or something like that to sort of like tell them like, oh, this is, here's a nice like, you know, party gift. I, I wrote a book and here it is, you know, that kind of thing. So that's not how it happened. The, um, the way that this book actually happened was, okay, I'm going to take you back for a second, um, just in case there's anybody interested in writing. By the way, if you have no interest in writing at all, this is the time to totally like let your mind wander. I wouldn't even mind if you're like on your phone right now or something like that. Just give me a couple minutes to talk to anybody who's sort of like slightly interested in writing. So here's how it happened. Back in, when I was a senior in high school, I had uh, a, 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 a teacher, I guess, who sort of said, okay, you, here's my assignment. You have to write in a journal every day for seven days. Just seven days straight. And we were like, well, what should we write? He's like, it literally doesn't matter. I'm not going to read it. I just need to know that you have written something. And we're like, okay. So we did that. Everybody got an A because literally all you had to do was write words. You could just write words, words over and over again. He wouldn't care. He just wanted to see that you wrote. But for me, I don't know. There was something really cool about it, right? Like it was like, so I ended up like writing like, you know, having kind of like a journal sized journal there. And I ended up writing like, you know, one page every night and found that I just like really liked it. And it wasn't like I was writing my deepest feelings, although there was some of that, but it was more just like, I just tried to sort of like, this sounds like, now I'm sounding like a total loser, which is not what I want to do on stage. But like, I was trying to sort of like make myself laugh. And I was trying to sort of like tell myself like something funny about the day or something, just like to entertain myself. I had other sources of entertainment. Don't go down this route. Like I was, I was, I had friends and all that kind of stuff. But there was something about like, you know, this that made me feel like, oh, this is like a fun thing to do, right? So I did that. And I ended up writing every night in this journal for the next like 11 years, right? I just like wrote, so I have like, I have a box of like stacks and stacks of journals from over the years. And there's literally nothing more about, well, my wife and kids, but like literally nothing more valuable than, I mean, like in generally like human life and stuff like that. Like within, this is something that's very valuable. It's not the most valuable thing to me, but it's very valuable, which is this box of like journals that I have because like now I can see, sort of see like who I was back from like being a senior in high school on, like throughout the course of my life. So I wrote and wrote and wrote and wrote for years. And then I had decided as I sort of started with to take this trip around the world, right? And I was like, oh my gosh, I'm gonna take this trip around the world. And I'm gonna tell all my friends like, you know, what I'm doing. So I was like, I was like, oh, I'm gonna like email them. And, uh, and my friends like within like two weeks were like, oh my God, Connor, you have to, you have to stop emailing us. Like we don't, uh, could not possibly care less like what you're doing on your travels. Like this is the most boring thing in the world. I was like, okay, and I did have other friends, but like, um, I'm making myself not sound like the coolest guy, but like, but I knew my parents liked it. So what I thought was, okay, this is the early days of uh, blog. So I'm like, okay, I am going to switch all this to a blog. So instead of writing in a journal, I'm going to write in a blog. Then people can either check it out or they don't have to check it out. So I started doing that and I started keeping a blog and I kept that for like years and years and years. And then a few years later, uh, I went to the University of Virginia and the, um, I mean, I had already gone, but like a few years later, the uh, newspaper from the University of Virginia published this little article about like, oh, hey, this alum, you know, Connor Grennan is doing this thing in Nepal. I was like, okay, great. But actually that was kind of impactful because uh, somebody who, you know, worked down there showed it to my future wife uh, who was at UVA law school, had finished UVA law school. And she's like, oh my gosh, I got to get in touch with this guy to find out how he did this. And then she came out and volunteered and I fell in love with her like two seconds later and like proposed to her like immediately. Literally, we got married. When I proposed to her, we'd spent only a total of like three weeks in the same room together, which I know sounds a little crazy, but we like talked every night. Uh, that's my favorite part of the book actually. Anyway, so like, so this is like, you know, got into like this little newspaper and then that went into the, the, um, the alumni magazine of the University of Virginia. And then the person who worked at the alumni magazine of the University of Virginia ended up going working for Reader's Digest, which I don't know who has Reader's Digest outside of like dentists or something like that, but people apparently still read this at some point. And that story got in there. And then an agent saw that and was like, oh, wow, this is a cool story and came to find me. And at the time I was getting my MBA uh, in New York and I was married and uh, our first son was on the way and all that kind of stuff. And she was like, you got to write this book. I'm like, I have no time to write this book like at all. And they're like, look, you, and she was like, why, why wouldn't you do this? And I was like, first of all, because 
there's no story here. Like, this is, like, insanely boring. Like, the story of, like, somebody going out to Nepal and volunteering is unbelievably boring story. I would never read that in a million years. And she's like, yeah, but that's not the story. The story is, like, you know, you were this person first, and then you kind of, like, transformed, and then you have, you know, some funny stories, and then these kids were lost, and then they got kidnapped, and then you had to fight off that guy, and then you went into the mountains, and you got hurt, and this happened at night, and then you met your wife, all this kind of stuff. And she painted this picture of, like, a story. I'm like, okay, I guess so. I guess that... that that's a little better, but like, but I also don't have time to, you know, write this. And she's like, Connor, you know, I printed out your blog, um, which where I told all the stories of Nepal. And I was like, right, but I have to write like 300 pages. She's like, your blog is 1500 pages long. Like you, all you have to do is like take the stories. Anyway, all that is to say that like, this is how this book came into being, right? Like I was just like writing and writing and writing and writing and writing. And then all of a sudden, like sort of like somebody found it. And it's a mantra that I live by, which is a mantra that actually sounds kind of weird and horrible, but stick with me for one second. And this mantra is this. What I like to do and what I started doing with this is actually, this, it started earlier. It started when I moved to Prague from University of Virginia. I went to UVA. I didn't do all that well. And so by the end, I like my GPA was fine, but it wasn't great. And I didn't have a job. And I'm like, oh my gosh, like, I don't have a job, man. And so like, I didn't want to like live in the closet of one of my friends or something. So I was like, you know what I'm going to do? I'm just going to like leave the country. People are like, what do you mean? I'm like, I'm just going to leave. And they're like, where are you going to go? I'm like, Prague. I don't know. And uh, so I moved to Prague for like three months, thinking that at least I'll have like this really cool story to tell people. So when people say, why don't you have a job? I'd be like, well, I was living in Prague. So like, that's why I don't have a job, because I don't want to work for the man. But like, anytime you have the chance to sort of like impress other people, you're probably going to gonna like end up doing something kind of impressive. And so that's how I kind of like live my life, right? By like trying to do things that would sound impressive to other people, which sounds weird, but it actually got me kind of far, right? So with this book in the end, it was totally accidental. I was just like, I was literally going and volunteering in Nepal to sound impressive to, you know, to girl people really, but just like to people in general. And all of a sudden it kind of like led to this. So the book and everything else was just this complete accident. Sorry, that was a very long way of answering um, that question. Okay, so next question. Um, oh, did I ever have like a favorite doll bot that stood out or, um, or did it all kind of taste the same? This is a good question. Um, so, the, the Dalbot that, it's not that I liked Dalbot, it was the Dalbot that I couldn't stand though, that they gave me like super, super spicy Dalbot because they just like liked to watch me. I was like Connor, you know, white person zoo that they would all gather around and sort of like wait for me to like hit that sort of like super spicy part of the Dalbot, which was, was apparently super funny to them, but but uh, not, you know, not to me at all. Um, do, I do I have anything I regret not putting in the book or am I completely satisfied with it? So here's what I wish I could put in the book. The thing is like writing a book, like they're going to like edit it down and all that kind of stuff. But I wish I could have put in there like more of the mistakes that I made. And all the mistakes that I made were really rooted around not understanding uh, the culture of the place. So just super quick, that mom that we talked about of the two kids, she lived obviously like, you know, three hours away. And so what we said was, why don't we build her like a little shack, like not shack, but just like kind of a small house next to the children's home. And then she could be with her kids and she can, you know, it seemed like a great idea, right? So we went to talk to her and we're like, hey, what do you think about us building this? And she was like, you know, through a translator, she was like, oh yes, great. And we're like, really, that would be, you'd like to live? She's like, oh yes, that would be great. So I went to the donors. This is when NGN, Next Generation Nepal was a very small organization. And we raised some money for uh, that, you know, raised like four or $5,000, which to us was a huge amount of money. And did that, built this little house, and uh, and then she didn't move in. And we're like, what happened? And she's like, oh, I can't. And we're like, but you told us you could. And we raised this money, and we built you a house. And why aren't you moving here? So it turned out that in Nepalese culture, especially like the, the really rural village culture, the woman isn't going to answer those questions. It's always the husband that answers the questions, and the husband wasn't around. But at the same time, the woman wasn't going to tell a, you know, a foreigner, like sort of who she perceived as powerful, no. So I could have asked her any, I could have been like, hey, how about we build you a, you know, a house on, on Jupiter? What do you think? And she'd be like, that would be amazing. You know, like it's, there was no way she was going to say no. And we didn't understand the culture enough to understand that she couldn't say no. So we ended up spending all this money building a house that she was never going to live in. And it was just, there was tons of stories like that that I wish I could have shared in the book of just like, how many times you screw up, you screw up, you screw up because we didn't understand the culture. And so now I think one of the big takeaways for me is just 
how much do I understand the culture or not understand the culture? Like how much am I sort of like really getting this or not getting this? And so that was for me like the big takeaway, which is so now when I sort of like go somewhere else, I'm like, okay, do I think I understand this place or do I really understand this place? And the answer is always, I don't understand this place. Um, I think that's about it. Hold on. I just have like maybe like one more minute. So let me just take my last minute or so just on this. Um, this is another little soapbox, but I promise I'll jump right off. One of the things that's kind of like a pet peeve for me is like when people say like when you're volunteering that you should be doing this for like the right reasons. Do you know what I mean? Like, well, you know, don't go out there just because it'll look good on a grad school application or don't go out there just because it'll impress other people or don't go out there. And I think like, why not? Like, why wouldn't you do that? Like, if you just wait for something that you're just like really going to be passionate about, you may never find that thing. Just go out and do things for your own motivation. Do it because like, yeah, I want to go out there and I want to sort of actually uh, impress other people. Or I want to do it because this girl that I think is really cute is actually doing that. Or I want to do it because I think this will look good in a grad school application or a, uh, a work application or something like that. Like, that's why you should do it. Because in the end, the people that you're helping, they could not possibly care less why you're doing it. So I just like, I hate, and I know that I'm sort of coming back to the same theme here, but like, don't let these things fool you. You know what I mean? Like, don't let like, like a, like a photo like this and a book cover like this, like fool you. Like people do things for their own reasons. Just keep on trying new things, trying new things, trying new things. And like, if you don't like something and these people say like, oh, let's go work at this, like, you know, homeless shelter for a weekend and you hate it, don't work there anymore. There's other people that will do that. Like keep going until you find your thing. But I feel like we have so much guilt on us sometimes of like not doing enough, you're doing enough, you're doing fine, you're in college, you're good, you're doing great already. That's really all I wanted to say, I promise. So um, I will let you all go. Thank you all for sort of like saying, I know this was sort of like an awkward way of doing it and everything like this, but you all have been just like super great and like awake and all that kind of stuff. So anyway, I really appreciate it. Thank you guys for coming today.